today we have George Wohar on the show. George is a mobile home connoisseur. Within 60 days of hearing about mobile homes, I bought my first mobile home for $3,500. I put about 2,000 into it. I then sold it for $52,000. After I saw that first one and I saw what it could do, I'm like, okay, I don't hear anyone else talking about it, so let's go all in. I'm fascinated by like ayahuasca, the retreat. Talk to me about your journey with all that. I'm all about just becoming a greater version of myself. I did a 53 hour training with the Navy SEALs. There was 32 people who signed up for it. There was like 20, four people who showed up and I think like 13 or like 15 of us actually completed it. Like there was three guys who dropped within the first hour. Welcome back to another episode of the Austin Zayback Show. Today we have George Wohar on the show and George is a mobile home connoisseur. Uh, I'll call you that. Love it. And uh, we were talking a bit before the show about some of the different ways and methodologies to to flip mobile homes, to acquire mobile homes, to you really do everything in the mobile home kind of arena. I know you, you've done some other stuff too. At the end of the pod, I want to actually talk about uh, some ayahuasca stuff and get into all that. Uh, we'll save that to the end. Uh, I'm actually pretty fascinated with all that. Uh, but I want to talk about, you know, for a half hour or so, maybe, you know, like everything people need to know when it comes to wholesaling a mobile home, buying and flipping a mobile home, buying rental properties via mobile homes, you know, like obviously you're crushing it, right? Yes. And you've made a lot of money and you found kind of a niche that you've been able to dive into and really like go all in on, right? And I'm excited to talk to you about it. So I appreciate you being on the show and sure. let's just jump into it, appreciate man. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, for sure. So uh, let, let's just start with when did you do your first ever mobile home deal, right? Like, did you have a mentor? Why did you, where, at what point in your life did you do that first deal? Walk me through that that first deal you ever did. Perfect. So my first deal is in 2017. The way I came across mobile homes is I knew I wanted to get into real estate. I wanted to branch into there. Everything, nothing was really jiving with me. Looking at multifamily, I was looking at wholesaling. I was looking at different forms and it wasn't jiving with me. And I knew I wanted to get into real estate. I just didn't know what it was. I ended up being connected to someone who was worth over $800 million. I was connected with him to do something else. It was junior achievements. He, ran, he was like the chancellor for me to do videos for them. I was doing a lot of videos on mindset. Two weeks later, we ended up going to the same event. So I'm sitting out to lunch with him on my left-hand side, the guy who owns the rights to the Think and Grow Rich Institute on my right-hand side. We were talking about things for like Think and Grow Rich and like maybe expanding to the millennial market. Then the guy on my left-hand side, he gets off the phone. And he's like, I was just talking to my broker and I'm selling my mobile home parks for $168 million. I was like, huh, tell me more. Yeah. So he just started taking me down the, I just started asking him questions. And he was kind of taking me down his journey. He owned a thousand mobile homes at that time. He's like, if you want to get started, get started with mobile homes. Mm -hmm. He started giving me ways to go about it, and I went all in at that point yeah. in time. Within 60 days of hearing about mobile homes, I bought my first mobile home for $3,500. They wanted $45,000 for it. I negotiated, broke it down. I can, I can get into that. Wow. Um, bought it for $3,500. I put about $2,000 into it. I then sold it for $52,000 on payments. I collected $7,500 as the down payment, so I was already in the green $2,000. Six fifty two per month for the next like sixty eight months. So just pure cash flow. I'm not the landlord. I have I'm the lien holder on title. I'm the bank. They're yep. paying me every single month. It becomes purely passive at that point in time. Sure. Sold that within thirty days. Before that one was done, I got my next one, and I just continued that process. After I saw that first one and I saw what it could do, I'm like, okay, I know what to look for. Yeah. I know that there's a big market here. I know I cracked the code on something. I don't hear anyone else talking about it. So let's go all in. Yeah, for sure. And were you already interested in getting into real estate, like? When you were sitting there with the guy on your left and the guy on your right, right? Like, were you already kind of looking at the industry of real estate in general, just wondering how, what what direction am I going to go? Yes, okay. I had my um, I had another business at that point in time. I was doing a lot of like mindset coaching, like that those different things. I knew I wanted to get into real estate. I wholesaled the deal. I was then looking into like multifamily deals and looking, but it just didn't jive with me. Mm -hmm. And again, I was just kind of like sitting there. I'm like, there's something out there and I know there's something out there. I'm just not sure what it is. And through the law of attraction, through yeah. all that good stuff, like the right mentor came into my life and just went all in on that. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to talk in a little while too about the law of attraction and all that. I think uh, it'll be really powerful for people. So yeah, let's kind of break down the mobile home game, right? Mm -hmm. Like obviously, you know, we were talking before the show. Um, I'm a big wholesaler. We've wholesaled I mean, I've personally wholesaled like 3,000 or 3,500 deals in my career, right? Um, between me and my partners, we've done over 10,000 wholesale deals in wholesales. our career, right? And uh, we've wholesaled a lot of mobile homes, you know, but I've never bought one. I've definitely never flipped one. And to be honest with you, I don't know a ton about them. I know the bare minimum, right? Mm -hmm. I know that, okay, if they're built after 19, or before 1976, you can't get financing. I know that, you know, if they're not affixed to the land, 
uh, then they're technically it's like we were talking before the show, right? Like they're it's a uh, an RV or it's considered like a car, a yeah. vehicle, right? So break down some of the nuance to to the mobile home game. Mm-hmm. So yeah, before 1976, you can't get financing. And for a while, I got started in 2000. That was in 2016 when I first got started. My first deal was in 2017. Um, so 2017, I got started. There wasn't much financing at all at that point in time. Like even for 1976 and newer, very hard to find that. That's where we bridge the gap, seller financing. And even now, it's like we do seller financing. That gives us the ability to make more passive income coming in every single month. Um, so that's a great bridge that we have for people who are looking for homes. They say it's the last real form of affordable housing, mobile homes, and the demand for it just continues to increase. Like mm. we, more and more people are moving to these mobile homes. Huge stigma around mobile homes. If you hear mobile home park, you think of trailer trash, you think yeah. of cops, you think of all this. Those aren't the parks now. There are parks like that. Those aren't the parks that we're in. And we have families that are moving to these homes. Families with nowadays, like nice cars, great jobs. They sell their home. They want to move to a community. So we have that that's moving into our communities. Wow. On the deals that I, like that, two different sides of the business that I have. We're doing like one-off deals and then we're buying in bulk. Our one-off deals, I'm looking for 180% ROI. Like that's the minimum ROI that mm-hmm. I'm looking for. And sourcing off-market motivated sellers. Like that's the way to go. Becoming the go-to person for these mobile home communities. Meeting the managers. Building relationships with the managers. They're the gatekeepers. Yep. They'll let you know who's moving, who's getting kicked out, who's behind on lot rent, who just passed away, whose kids took over the home, all this. And when you're able to really build that relationship there, again, you become the go-to person for these communities. So you can get 10 deals at a time, three deals at a time, five deals at a time. And it's it makes it a very nice way to scale, mm. especially with there being such little competition in this industry. Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but the majority of the views that we get are from people that are not subscribed. So do me a huge favor and subscribe if you like the podcast so far. Smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. And let's just go ahead and get back to the interview. So let's break down each one for a minute, right? Let's talk about the single mobile home acquisition, right? And then in a minute, we'll talk about, you know, buying a park and actually doing that whole thing, right? So when you're looking at a single mobile home acquisition, and to be clear, you're specifically talking about mobile homes that are not affixed to the land, right? Okay, so like... Let's also talk a little bit about that. Okay. And and like why wouldn't you do the ones that are affixed to the land, which would be like a real estate deal. Mm-hmm. So the ones inside of parks, this is mainly what we're going for. Like this is the model that I've mastered, one inside of parks. It's a very simple process. They're considered vehicles. So we go in, I can look at the mobile home, I can give them an offer that day or the next day. I can have it I can own it the next day and have my guys working in it that day if they're not living in it, obviously. Have my guys in it and have it flipped within 30 days because it's such a simple process. They sign the title. We bring the titles to the title company, and that's it. It's done. So that's our main model that we're doing. Mm-hmm. And we've found it. Like People want the simplicity of it now, and we have people who are moving from apartments. right? Apartment prices are going up, and they're small, getting smaller and smaller for the yeah. price that they have. So we have a lot of people moving to these parks, and it's just such a simple model inside of mobile home parks, and it makes it very easy to scale versus if they're on land, it's considered typical real estate, Mm -hmm. right? So it's the same process. It could take a couple months to close on it. It can, this process here and there, and we're able to get them for such low price points inside of parks. Mm. Another reason for that is the motivation of people who are selling mobile homes is a lot higher than motivation of single family homes, Mm. as in like they're willing to get it off their hands a lot easier. Yeah. If uh, someone's kids are passed down this mobile home, they just see it as a pain point. They don't want to pay the lot rent every single month, which could be like 300 400 500 up to $1,200 per month, depending on where you are. And they just see the mobile home as like junk. They don't want to deal with it. They don't see the value in it. So they're willing to get it off their hands for as quick, as quick as possible for just like anything, really. Yeah. As opposed to a single family home, if it gets passed down to someone, they want the best price for it. Mm-hmm. Mobile homes, they don't. Especially in realtors, like they don't want to deal with mobile homes. Some of them will just take them under, but they don't put time, energy, or effort into selling mobile homes inside of parks because such very little profit. Yeah. So that's how we're able to um, just really get in there. And that's our angle. Motivated sellers, you got the mobile home, you took it over, we'll jump in, we'll take it off your hands so you don't have to pay lot rent. That's their pain point. Kids could live out of state in that state. They see it as a piece of junk and we know that there's treasure in it. Mm. So I'm obviously familiar with comping a piece of real estate, right? Mm-hmm. And comping is, for people who don't know, the process of figuring out what a home is worth, right? And to comp a house, as you know, um, you you look at the house, the subject property that you're looking at, and then you you say, okay, what other houses in that same subdivision or area have sold in the last you know six months or whatever that are um, similar in everything, right? Mm-hmm. Similar bedroom, bathroom, the whole thing, right? 
and and then that's how you ultimately come up with a value and and that's how an appraiser is going to determine the value of, of a piece of real estate in america right for the yes. most part, give or take that's obviously the simplified version of it right so how in the world do you comp a, a mobile home when we're talking about like you know with a car if i sell my car in craigslist i can go on kelly blue book right yeah and i can be like all right what, what can i get it for my car you know 2022 you know audi whatever right so how do you comp a mobile home? Yeah, so if there's other homes that sold inside that park, like that's obviously a simple way to go about it, or local parks, you can look at it that way as well. Some parks are different, though. They vary. So it's a little more difficult to comp. Um, what we do is we'll look at past sales. We'll look at same things that you would do for like a single family, past sales if there's anything inside the park. And we also will run test ads. So our test ads will share homes that are similar to the ones that we're going to be selling or the ones that we're going to be purchasing. And we'll see the demand, and we'll put up certain price points, and we'll see the demand of the marketplace. Mm. If we're selling for, let's say we want to sell it for $70,000, we'll put up homes that are similar for $70,000 and see the demand. Test the market. Are they willing to buy for this amount? How much cash do they have? Are they willing to pay all cash? Do they want to make payments? If it comes to selling on seller financing, we'll look at two-bedroom apartments in the area. What do they go for? Okay, if we're selling a two-bedroom mobile home, we're selling on seller financing. What's the down payment that we can collect? And then what's the monthly payment? Mm. If we're selling on seller financing, let's say the park lot rent is $500 per month the two bedroom um, apartments are going for $1,200. Then we'll know that we can collect about $600, $700 per month towards the mortgage of the home. Mm -hmm. So we'll say this is what our monthly price is. So we're looking at just sales inside of parks. If there's no sales and we'll run test ads and just see like, what are people willing to buy it for? Hey, really quick, I'm sure you already know, but I've done over 2,500 wholesale deals in my career, and me and my team consistently do anywhere from one to two wholesale deals a day. If you're looking to get better at wholesaling or maybe you're brand new, you've never wholesaled a deal, uh, I would actually love to coach you. I would love to mentor you, and I would love for you to be a part of our education program. All you have to do is go to www.flippinsimple.com or you can find a link in the description down below and book a strategy session with my team to see if you would be a good fit for our coaching program. Again, this is our exact strategy and formula of how we are actually able to go out every single day and do anywhere from one to two wholesale deals a day. Nobody's talking about what we're doing and I really look forward to coaching you and mentoring you. So again, go to www.flippinsimple.com. Now let's just go ahead and get back to the show. Yeah, it's super interesting. And what is the size, the average size of a mobile home that you're flipping or that you're purchasing? I mean, is it, are they two bed, two bath? Are they, what are they, 800 square feet? I mean, how big are they? Yeah, typically 980 square feet would be like the minimum, like 14 by 70, and then up to 1,600 to 1,700 square feet. Really? Single wides and double wides, yeah. Wow, okay. And do they get any bigger than that, or is that about as high as they go? They do get bigger. Um, the more that they're making them now, like, but those aren't the ones that we're buying. We're typically yeah. buying like the 1,400 square feet would be like the biggest that we're purchasing. Are there years that you won't touch? Like, are there years that you're like, nah, I ain't touching it, you know? I don't love anything newer than 1976, but if the demand is there, then we'll buy them. You don't love anything newer. Uh, older, I'm sorry. Okay. Older than okay, I. Thank you for catching on that. Older than 1976. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we are like, we'll buy them if there's a demand for it. I like to know that they can get financing potentially, and just like the newer homes, like it's mm -hmm. nicer having it newer than 1976. Anything like that 1970s and older than that, like it's it's just not gonna be worth it yeah. for people to purchase it and different things of that sort. Um, so I like 1976 and newer. That's mm -hmm. ideally what I'm going for. Two bedrooms minimum. Really? Yeah. And, and can you get a two bedroom and a single wide? Yeah. You can? Yeah. Okay. Got it. And, and are single wide or double wide if you had to take your pick? I mean, what's going to be the most uh, profitable on the back end? Double wide for double sure. Double wide. Yeah. Okay. Like, for example, one deal that we just did, I bought it for 12000 I could have sold it the next day because it's not marketed by these by the sellers, motivated sellers. I could have sold it the next day for 45000 Instead, I put $28,000 into it. And then I ended up selling it for, I think I put 26 into it. I ended up selling it for 127,000. So I have a nice return on that one. We put, we completely gutted it, completely renovated that one. Wow. What it, what's different about remodeling or renovating a mobile home versus like a single family home? Like, is the plumbing different? You know, talk to me about the renovation. Are you hiring the same type of crew that you would hire for a single family? Yeah, you can. Um, it's a lot simpler than single family houses. Now there's some nuances, some different things like the pipes underneath the mobile home. Like for example, one of the mobile homes we just purchased, we had to, it wasn't winterized. So we had mm -hmm. to completely repipe the bottom of it. it Cost us $1,200 to completely repipe the hole underneath of it. So not bad. Um, there are some different nuances, but they're very simple. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of contractors, like they'll come in and be like, this looks like a movie set. Like how <laughs> simple it is just to redo all the work. Yeah. And we're getting them completely gutted and remodeled within 25 days. 
mm-hmm. everything from the ground up, like a 1,400 square foot mobile home. Wow. You know, with single family, right, you can, um, there's so many different ways that you can find a good deal. You know, when we look at, and I teach it a lot, I talk about, okay, you can, you can go direct to seller and you can pull data, right? And you can cold call or you could run ads or direct mail or you could uh, put a bandit sign out on the corner, right? You could work with real estate agents and get them to bring you deals. You can co-wholesale and, and work with other wholesalers and have another wholesaler bring you a deal and then wholesale it again, right? Or buy it or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, how are you typically finding a good deal um, in the mobile home world? A lot of those same methods, bandit mm-hmm. signs are a great way to do so. We're not putting them inside of the parks. We're putting on the outside perimeter, streets that are leading up mm-hmm. to it, stop signs leading up to it. So bandit signs are a great way. Building relationships with the park managers is another go-to. I'll get 10 deals at once from park managers. So it's like, that's another great way. Sending out postcards and flyers to people inside the community. If we're allowed by the community, we build a relationship with management. They'll let us door knock and hand Mm -hmm. out postcards and different things of that sort, hand out business cards. Mm -hmm. Driving through the parks is another great way. Once you get your name inside that park and you know the people in the community, you know the management in the community, and you've built a great relationship with management, like that's a golden that's a golden ticket for you. Yeah. For, if there's a 50 space park or 100 space park, 150 space park, there's going to be multiple homes that are being sold and people who are letting go of their homes, people who are passing away. So if you can do that and become that go-to person, like that's your golden ticket. You get six parks, seven parks, 10 parks that you're doing that for, boom, you're in. Yeah, for sure. So let's transition for a second and talk about the parks. Yes. And buying a whole park or being an owner of a park. You know, being an owner of the land that'll rent the, because how does that work, right? Like if 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 you if you said, hey, I want to buy a park, um, <clears throat> you you have to plumb the whole park, I'd imagine, and get electricity and get all your 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 stalls available, right? And then you don't own, you just rent out the land essentially to 150 or 200 people, don't you? Yeah, 100. percent Park owners are in the lot rent business. Mm-hmm. If you now there are some park owners who own the homes too, park owned homes, but then you're in the management business. You have right. to people are calling you the issues here, issues there. But if you're just in the lot rent business, you take over a park. It's hard to build parks nowadays mm. because tax wise, towns don't want mobile home parks and then people in the community. So if you're taking over a park, you'll go in. If there's park owned homes, typically like sell those, get those off their hands. This is what we work with park owners as well to get the to start flipping mobile homes inside of their park, get it off their hands. Um, but yeah, you're just in the lot rent business. You want to collect your lot rent. There's 100 homes in your park, $500 per month in lot rent. You're collecting that every single month. Mm. And you're just maintaining the common areas, and that's it. Why wouldn't everybody do that? That versus like owning the park owned homes? Yeah, or or even just like flipping uh, individual homes. I mean, why just, wouldn't everybody just want to be the park owner? Yeah, I mean, that's the that's go to. Like, that's yeah. part of our process as well. Like, we're looking at parks to purchase. A little more difficult, more money goes into it, mm-hmm. takes more time. The single family, the single homes that we're flipping, the mobile homes, it's faster. Mm-hmm. Cash comes in within 20 days, 30 days. The parks, just a long-term play. Yeah. The mobile homes is just that quick cash coming in. How much could you buy a park for? I mean, they go up 15 million, 20 million. Really? Parks on the coast, like they can go up to, I think the highest park sale was like, don't quote me on this, but I think it was like 70 million or wow. something. Yeah. Where at? In California. Malibu, there's some mobile homes in there where they're being sold for like $10 million, $6 million. Holy cow. Yeah, it's insane. It's insane. Yeah. Along yeah. the coast, are crazy. Sam Zell owned a lot of those. Uh-huh. Those coastal parks in Florida and California, different states like that. Yeah, they get pricey. Do you own a park? No. I have okay. one under contract, but I don't own one right now. Or what are you going to do with the one you have under contract? Um, purchase it, bring homes into it. Mm-hmm. There's been a lot of the issues with it, so we're figuring out if we're going to be closing on it or not. Yeah. Um, but we have an infill, so there's 30 homes inside of that community right now. There's 50 lots, so it'd be infilling homes inside of it to value add, um, just making it look nicer, making it look prettier. The lot rent's very low, so over time, when you buy a park, you'll increase the lot rent. You don't want to mm. go up $200 per month right from the beginning. Right. $50 per month for the year, and then the next year, like another 50 next year, another 20 slowly raise it up if it's not at market value, and most parks aren't, because a lot of the parks mom and pops own right now, they haven't raised lot rents, they haven't done much to them, and they're ready to get them off their hands, and that's what's happening a lot. Yeah. Right now. Where at in the U.S. would you recommend somebody focus on the mobile home game? You know, like you said a little while ago, you don't like Arizona, right? Now, do you not like Arizona for mo- for the mobile home industry? Or you said you like New York, you like Florida, you like that kind of side of the country, right? Yeah. I so. mean, Arizona's great for mobile home industry. It just wasn't my vibe for living here, Got it. guys. Got it. Um, but it's great. All states besides Hawaii and Alaska, 
you can do this business in. Why not Hawaii and Alaska? Hawaii, they don't have any mobile home parks. Really? They have a few, but they're for like homeless people. So that really wouldn't work out the business yeah. model. And then Alaska, I think they only have a couple as well. And it's so cold out there. Like uh. doing work on those homes. I don't know how that would work. <laughs> yeah, I can't even imagine. Yeah. But everywhere else you could do it. Yes. Okay. And are there different places in, in America, though, that are more profitable or more simple? I mean, like, you know, where would you go if you could take your pick? Because Arizona has a ton of them, yeah, don't we? There's a ton for right? sure. I feel like we got to be like in the top five of all, every state in the because you had all the snowbirds and everybody who lived. Yeah, there. there's a ton of parks. I don't know if it's top five, but there's so many. There's a ton in South Carolina. Like that's one of the state. Texas, there's a ton. South Carolina might be the second most, and Texas really? I think is the first. Really? Um, yeah, there's a ton. South or North Carolina. So those are good areas. Um, Florida, there's a ton of mobile homes as well. Difficult getting insurance for the mobile homes in Florida, mm. just because everything that happens out there, the hurricanes and whatnot. One mark, two markets that I'm focused in. I was born and raised in New Jersey, so New Jersey, Pennsylvania. You can get great profits on them. They sell for a great price point, mm. so that's another great area. Then there's some like some areas where they sell for very low, like a lot of Southern Alabama, whatnot. Like they're not going to be selling them for one hundred and eighty thousand yeah. dollars, one hundred and forty thousand dollars inside of parks. So it just varies. Now there's money you can make money everywhere. You won't make as big of profits in some states, but as long as you're building the business and you're doing it right, like you can move through mobile homes one after the next. Sure. You talked a little while ago about you being the bank, right? And mm -hmm. and and doing a seller carry on the deal. Like walk me through that. Why would you do why would somebody want to do that versus just selling it, you know, and just getting it off their hands? Yeah. You can usually make more if you're doing seller carry. Um, if I can't make more in deals, then I'll sell them for all cash and just sell them out, right? It varies on home to home. Sometimes there's not the people can't pay all cash for these deals. Like the demand isn't there for buying a home for mobile home for $80,000. People aren't really getting financing and you can get it off your hands faster. Mm. If my objective is always to collect my all in costs on their down payment, like mm. that's always my objective. For example, the one that I said I was all in 50, I think it was 5,800 on that one. I sold it. My down payment was 7,500 that I collected. So I always want to be all in. And then it feels nice to just have that passive cash flow coming in every single month as well um, from that. And you can tack on interest to it, and then you can end up getting a lot more for it in the end. Sure. How do you protect yourself in the mobile home world when you're doing a seller carry, right? Because you're talking about an RV or a car at the end of the day. So how do you how do you write the contract? How do you make sure that they're going to pay you every month? You know, who's is there a third party uh, company, title company, attorney, somebody that is handling it for you, or you just like, kind of hope and pray? Yeah, so we have all the contracts set in place in order for, and obviously people can go against contracts, mm -hmm. like that happens all the time. We have all the contracts, we make sure our buyers are completely vetted. Most of the time, mobile home parks will do the vetting because they're living in the park indefinitely, they're paying the lot rent indefinitely. So they wanna make sure that the people who are buying the homes or who are living inside their parks, they have X credit score, they have job history, mm -hmm. they check their criminal background and all that good stuff. So they usually do the vetting for us, but we always wanna make sure we have quality buyers that's always my go-to. I'd say I'd rather hold a mobile home for a couple extra months than get someone in who's going to be a headache from the beginning. So we, yeah. that's one of the, the best things that we do is make sure of that. Um, and then if they end up defaulting, like cash for keys, we'll give them back their non-refundable deposit. If they default on the park, the par it's a lot easier for the park to get them not out necessarily. They can't move the mobile home. It's five to $10,000. So they don't have the money. They're not moving it. Mm -hmm. So the park can kick them out of the mobile home. And then the park takes over the mobile home. And then we'll make a deal with the park. Like we'll get the mobile home back or we'll just pay their back lot rent and then take over the home. Why is it so much to move a mobile home? Because you have to get it. You have to have movers pick it up. Uh, movers have to get it. And then they have to like take them off the ground and put the hitches on it and different things of that sort. And it's just difficult yeah. moving them. Like imagine a truck moving one of those big mobile homes. Like you'll see it down the highway, but making a way making its way out of a park and angling around the park and then in some states they're hud states so you have to set the concrete pad the new concrete pad place it down it's just a lot of difficulties talk to me to about it. the hud and the concrete and all that yeah so concrete pads like new jersey's a hud hud state they have to have a concrete pad and brand new concrete pad has to be set under the mobile home before if you're going to move it if you're going to be moving Got it. it yeah so they want a new pad every time you move it every time so if one's being moved on the land Got then a new pad has to be put on it interesting yeah. i wonder why yeah i don't know just difficulties. So you got to go like pour the concrete or what? Yeah. So the parks will usually do that or we'll hire someone to do it. A lot of the parks that I'm in, they'll do it for us, but you'll hire someone to pour the concrete pad. Got it. If you're currently wholesaling real estate and you aren't using a CRM, then you're doing it wrong and you're leaving a ton of money on the table. We are one of the largest wholesalers in the nation and by far the number one tool that we use every single day 
is a phenomenal CRM, right? And a CRM is obviously a customer relationship management tool that will keep track of all of your leads. It'll follow up with people on your behalf. Uh, even if you have a nine to five, right? A good CRM will be working for you while you're working at your job. So when you come home, you have a bunch of people to talk to to buy their property, okay? Now obviously we have a CRM, it is called SimpleSend, and all you have to do is go to www.simplesend.com to check it out. It is by far my favorite CRM. We built it out over the years, and it will literally do everything you need it to do to become a phenomenal wholesaler. So go to www.simplesend, check it out, and I'm telling you, you will not regret it. You said a little while ago developing like um, mobile homes, uh, parks, for example, is not really something that people are doing anymore. Do you see anybody doing it right now? I mean, like, are there people out there still trying to do development, you know, for, for a park? Yeah, there are definitely people who are out there who are working on doing it. There's only 40,000 mobile home parks in America, and they say it's, it's the numbers going down. People are taking them over, turning them into parking lots, knocking them down, because a lot of the mom and pops who own them previously, they're not managing them properly. They're not raising the lot rents properly, and they're like, all right, we're done. We're not making any money on them. Um, but there are people who are out there who are doing the development. There's just a lot of costs that go into it, all the sewage, all the electricity, all those lines, townships, all the permits and whatnot, a lot of townships, because tax purposes, like they're not getting paid taxes on each one of the mobile homes. They don't want them inside of their towns. And then people who live in the community, they'll, they don't want them inside their community at all either. Yeah. Just hearing like a mobile home park is going to be in your community. Like, no, I don't want that here. But you said a little while ago, it's not necessarily anymore what people, what you think. Exactly. It's not, but there's such a huge stigma around it. <clears throat> That's why even just in the real estate in general, like people aren't getting into mobile homes or flipping mobile homes because the stigma around it. Like there's still such a huge stigma, trailer trash, cops, like I don't want to deal with that. People aren't going to make their payments. It's like that's not the case. Yeah. I feel like the stigma is starting to be broken down a little bit, but not not much. You got to get on more podcasts and keep talking sure, about exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Eventually it will be. You yes. know? Uh Yeah. No, I think mobile homes are great. You know, talk to me about like, like you look at, a, I just did a tour, a business tour not too long ago with a company called Boxable. Are you familiar with them? No. They're like, um, you see, did you see like Elon bought that little tiny home? Yes. It's like the foldable tiny home. Yes. So they're, that's the company who made it, right? Boxable. And, and it's basically a home, a tiny home made in a factory, right? Mm -hmm. So it you like folds up, you can put it on a trailer, you can ship it. It's only eight and a half feet wide or whatever. So you can drive it down the road. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, do you ever see that being the future, but like that on like a mobile home park? It's interesting. So those inside of parks, they need to be HUD approved and those aren't HUD approved. After 1976, that's why that you're able to get financing. They became HUD approved. There's a HUD stamp on it, different things of that sort. Um, I don't, it could be, but I don't know. It just doesn't seem like, it seems like it's a different market and it's a different demographic who are going after that versus mobile homes inside mm -hmm. of mobile home parks. So there may, there are parks too or areas that are being built up where they're bringing those type of homes in there. So like Home Depot, you can buy one for like $50,000 and just get it put on your land or even cheaper. Um, I don't necessarily see it replacing the mobile home space or being brought inside of mobile home parks. Now mm -hmm. they have their own area, their own parks that they'll put them in or their own like pieces of land that they'll put them in. Regulations and different things of that sort. Now things may get passed eventually mm -hmm. where you can bring those in. I don't know. I don't necessarily see it replacing it. Yeah. What about like owning a, a, a park and explain to me maybe the difference of, okay, you know, you, you, you're seeing a lot more people, I think, I'm seeing on YouTube and stuff like that, right? People getting into, like, the actual, like, RV world. Mm -hmm. Like, or, or like, the, um, you know, what became real popular was all the trailers and, like, the, the little Sprinter van, you know, with, like, and they're, like, living out of the van, right? Yes. And you see people traveling all over the world now in a, mo in a, in a motorhome, right? Mm -hmm. Or an RV, like, an actual motorhome. And correct me if I'm wrong, they're, those people are parking in mobile home parks aren't there around the nation when they're trapped when they're if even if i get my rv here and i want to go to florida like i gotta sleep somewhere i gotta stay somewhere where are they staying yeah so there's rv parks and then some of them will some mobile home parks will allow them some states don't allow rvs to be parked inside really? some townships but there are rv parks as well <clears throat> now that's a whole different business model and that's starting to grow now as well owning rv parks it's just the the mobile home parks the residents are a lot more permanent because mm. it costs so much rv parks they can get up and leave the next day so they're mainly parking in RV parks or some mobile home parks, as mentioned, like they'll allow them in there. Mm -hmm. And it also varies. Like some of them have empty lots and they'll let someone come in for a week, for a couple of days and just get that rent to come in. The main objective of owning a mobile home park though is to have all the lots filled with mobile homes. Yeah.
Yeah, you want to get you want the cash flow. Yeah. Right? And you want a, the passive income of the mobile home park. Yeah. So do you plan on getting into owning a bunch of parks? Yeah, 100%. Okay. Yeah. Why not just syndicate a park or why not just raise the capital on a park? I mean, like if they're 10, 15, 20, 30 million, you know, I mean, you you could pull that off, right? Yeah. You could just go raise the money, syndicate it. And there's some for a lot less. Like the one that we're working on right now is 600,000. So oh, it's wow. a lot less. Um, but yeah, that's the whole other part of the business right now. We see scaling this mobile home side of things as we're scaling, like we're going to be purchasing 120 park home homes at once. So we're like, let's scale this. And as we're doing this simultaneously, we're working on parks as well. Mm -hmm. So getting the parks in play and getting that going too. When you buy 120 at one time, what do you do with them? So we're going to get in crews in the different States cause they're going to be in different areas. We have some in Florida, some in West Virginia, some in Alabama, like different areas, getting crews in there and just flipping them, getting the work really? done to them and selling them. Selling them individually. Individually. One yes. at a time. Yes. Yeah. Because that's where you really make your money, right? Yes. Selling yep. them individually. Yeah. Yeah. Like I had a guy on the show yesterday. Um, he flips uh, like MLB, in, in, in NBA, NFL uh, cards, okay. like sports, like the actual like playing, you know, like yeah. cards. And, you know, you can buy them in bulk, right? And then but when you sell them individually is where you make all the money, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, somebody might want to sell a whole collection and they don't understand the value of each individual card, yes. right? And it might be the same with you where it's like, hey, so is it one owner selling you the 120? Yeah, um, a couple different owners. Okay, yeah, got it. A couple it. different owners that we're working and with. And they probably don't know the individual value of each one if they were all flipped up, nor do they care or have the time. Yeah, they don't have the time. Mainly, they don't have the time. They're like, we're, our objective is to buy more parks. We don't have the time. We don't want to put the energy, the effort into the homes. And that's where a lot of park owners' heads are at. We just want our lot rent. Mm. So if you take over these homes and you flip them, we're going to get an increase of $40,000 per month in our in our, um, in our our monthly income from mm -hmm. these parks. So that's all they want. They're like, I want my income coming in. I want to buy more parks. Like, all right, we'll work on the homes for you. We'll take over the homes. Yeah, it's so fascinating. What's the most amount of money you've ever made flipping a mobile home? One single mobile home, $88,000. 88 grand. Yes. Talk to me about that deal. So that deal, I mentioned it a little bit. Okay. I bought that one for $12,000. I They wanted 45000 for it. I always like... I know their motivation level and like what they really need for it and whatnot. And I was going back and forth with the buyer. As soon as I walk in, I go, what's the lowest fair price that you're willing to take for it? Immediately he said 23,000. So I'm like, awesome. All right. We got a $20,000 discount, $22,000 discount. Yeah. And he's like, we're, are you, did you go through our realtor? I'm like, Oh, I didn't know you were working with a realtor. He's like, Oh no, we're not anymore. Our contract's up with a realtor, but did you go? I'm like, no, I didn't even know you had a realtor. Like, How much was your realtor's commission? He told me, I'm like, okay, so that gives us a little more wiggle room here. And then I called them back the next day and I let them know, like, with everything that needs to be done, the most that, and I, and I tell everyone, I'm very transparent, uh, end buyer may be willing to pay that much for it, but we're not. We're investors. I can get it off your hands. I can literally bring you the check today. I can get it off your hands. They needed to be out of the park. They were getting kicked out of the park. I can literally get it off your hands today. I can hand you this $12,000 check. Are you open to that? Yes. Perfect. We bought it. Yeah. $12,000. We listed it. Within the next day, I could have sold it for $45,000. Yeah. I then knew that I wanted to do work to it. Double wide, had a nice land behind it as well. Even though it was in a park, had a decent amount of land. Put $28,000 into it. We completely gutted that from the ground up and sold that one for $127,000. Wow. So we're about thirty-eight dollars all in, sold it for $127,000. Talk to all me cash. About all cash. Mm -hmm. How quick? Um, Total turnaround. Within 60 days. 60 days. Yeah. Eighty-eight grand, 60 days, mobile home. Yes. Talk to me about the worst mobile home you ever flipped. Have you ever lost money on a deal? No, never. Okay. The worst one I ever flipped, I bought it for, and I've done all my deals have been great, but I bought it for fifteen hundred, very inexpensive. Uh, it just took us a long time to get things done to it. It took us about three, uh, two months. The pipes underneath, the guy who I had working on it, he wasn't sure what he was doing with it, so he'd fix one pipe and the other one would burst, and fix <laughs> one, the other one would burst. I was traveling at the time too, so it was just a headache. The person who we bought it from, they're like, hey, yeah, we, uh, I think this was the third one I ever bought. There, he was like, we just lived in it. We got rid of it. We're not living it anymore. We're moving to Florida. But then we got inside. The toilets were like all crusted over. Mm -hmm. Like this hasn't been lived in for probably years. Yeah. Air conditioning unit, eight central AC unit. He's like, yeah, there's just a part that needs to get put into it, like a chip that we need. We took it off. It was completely like empty. Like there's nothing underneath the, the <laughs> shell of the unit. I wasn't aware of what I was doing much at that point in time. Yeah. Still a great deal. I sold that one for... $32,000 in like 60 days. And what'd you buy it for? I bought it for 1500. Okay. So it's still a great deal. It yeah. was just a pain in the ass. Yeah, 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 for sure. And, and so you said you just go to the DMV. Yeah. To do all this, all the paperwork and everything's just at the DMV. Yeah, they literally, so we'll do the paperwork. We'll have the contract signed. We'll do that at the mobile home. They just need to have their signature on the title and we bring it to the DMV. We give them the check when they hand us the title. We want to make sure there's no liens on it or anything. And we bring the title to the DMV, a title company, MVC, whatever it is nowadays, different states, different things. Yeah. Um, and that's it. And we own it. Yeah. 
And uh, a lot of that stuff's online even now too, isn't it? Um, f- no, we usually have to go in person. Okay, yeah, for that. But like, aren't the aren't a lot of the titles like the actual when you own a property or a car vehicle free and clear? The titles actually online now, like the MVD. We've never gotten titles online. Really? They're always yeah physical copies of the hmm. title. And if they don't have the physical copy of the title, then it's like you won't buy it. Yeah, we have they we got to make sure that they go through everything to get the title. And there's different things that has to be done. Like there's one that we're working on right now. The person's mother owned it. The title was never in her name. It's a beautiful deal, but they don't have the title. I'm like, I can't buy it. Yeah. No one's going to buy it from us. Right. We'll be for stuck sure. with it. It's like buying the salvage title car. Exactly. You know, yeah. what are you going to do with that? Nothing. Right. Yeah. Resell. You might get a good deal, but you ain't going to be able to resell it. Exactly. You know, it ain't going to do you any good. Yeah. Are you in the business ever of just buying a mobile home and just renting it out? No. Most parks don't allow renting. Really? Some do. So we, we're open to it. Uh, most parks don't allow renting, though. They want owners inside the communities. But when I say most, it depends what state you're in. Mm-hmm. So a lot of states will, a lot some states won't. Some of the homes that we're purchasing when we're purchasing in bulk like this, we may rent some of them out just to get some off our hands faster, but we also don't want to deal with the management of the mobile homes. Mm. When we're selling them on seller financing, we're not getting any calls. We tell them we're the bank. That's it. I don't care what happens in the mobile yeah. home. We're selling as is to you. Make sure you yeah, look at everything. You're the owner. You're not a tenant. You're the owner. Exactly. Yeah. So we don't get any calls on them, and I don't want to have to have someone out there to take a look at the mobile home because the expenses for that just adds up. Yeah, for sure. I can't even imagine why. I get. Yeah, I guess to your point, it, you either flip them and do what you're doing. Maybe you do a seller finance, or you own the whole park, mm-hmm. and exactly. you're and you're a lot guy. You know, you're making money on the lot, right? Exactly. On each individual lot, but you're not going to rent the individual mobile home. No. Yeah. Are you ever going to dabble, do you think, in anything else? Like, are you just going to go all in on mobile homes? Mobile homes and mobile home parks. Yeah. Those are my two. For now. I don't know. I may eventually dabble. Like, I have a couple multifamilies, but mobile homes and mobile home parks are my go-to. Yeah. What do the multifamily deals look like that you own? So, I have one. It's, um, I mean, it collects nice nice money, but it's just management. Like, yeah. I get, I just got a text message from my tenant today. One of the things are leaking. I'm like, I have to send someone out there. So, yeah. it's just like the different headaches and the different management that has to be done with it. Like, I don't, I don't love that aspect How of it. How many units is that one? That one's three. Three, okay. Yeah. Triplex. Where, where at? Yeah. Oh, uh, New Jersey. New Jersey. Yeah. Okay. And you're just like, you're going to sell it eventually, you think? or I don't know. Yeah. I might just hold on to it. It brings nice cash flow. Why not like storage? I feel like mobile homes and storage are so similar. Yeah. Mobile home parks and the storage, like, they get compared a lot. Yeah. Very similar. So that may be something else that I'm open to. Mm-hmm. I'm just really gung-ho inside the mobile home parks and the mobile homes right now. But, I mean, I'm open. Yeah. I'm have not you turning ever, things have down. Have you ever like looked into the storage world at all i have okay yeah and what have you found when you've kind of explored it um i haven't explored it too deep Mm -hmm. but i know like same thing right people are people have their stuff in there they're making payments every single month there's not much management that has to be done they own their lockers they own their units you're getting nice cash flow from these the the one thing that came up is like mobile the mobile home parks and mobile homes it's like a recession proof industry people are making their payments even during i had one person who was a week late during all of the pandemic one week late that was it wow everyone else is making their payments because they're the owners they're like this is my last my last chance of like home ownership if i lose this and i'm going back to an apartment i'm going back to somewhere i don't want to be so i just see it as very recession proof we're going to be getting our payments like all the time with when it comes to storage units People, if like, they don't want their stuff in it anymore, they'll just leave their stuff, and they're like, stop making payments. Yeah. So it can be management intensive. But, I mean, I'm open to the storage industry, too. Yeah, but then you take all their crap. It's like storage wars. Yeah, exactly. Know? Take their stuff, start selling off. I've always wondered, like, how legit is all that? You know, right? like, if I owned a big storage, you know, facility, because I, I want to get into storage one day, you know? And, uh, like, when you watch the TV show of, like, breaking into the unit and, like, getting all the crap, like, how often does that really happen? You have gold in there, right? You know what I mean? MLB cards, right, NFL cards. Yeah. Like a bunch of Poke, Pokeo Pokemon or Pokemon. Cards. Yeah, <laughs> Pokeo. Uh, Pokemon cards. Yeah, dude. Like, uh, I, I don't know. I feel like that could be a cool industry to get into. For sure. Yeah. Makes you wonder if you could ever, no, nah, not that you would ever do it, but you probably couldn't, but have like a, um, you know, have a, a property zone to where you could have both, you know, where you have kind of one end where you did storage and then another end where you had like a mobile home park. There are some the that have that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, there are definitely some that have that. There's a lot of people who talk about, like, why would you want storage inside of mo- with a mobile yeah. home park? Like, it's just a weird combination. But there all, are also a lot of owners mm-hmm. who are mobile home park owners and they're storage owners because it, it's just a very similar They're very model. similar. Yeah, mm-hmm. very, very similar. So let's talk for a minute about the law of attraction and all that. You, you, you said you used to be a mindset coach and all that. How did you get into all that before you got into the mobile home world? Yeah, so I got deep into the fitness space. So I dropped out of college after my sophomore year. Freshman year, I joined a frat, partying, drinking, doing all that crazy stuff. Sophomore year, I got deep into fitness, back into fitness because I wrestled from high school. I'm not from high school, from kindergarten on. 
Um, got back into fitness and I'm like, I'm committing to this. Every single Sunday, I lived in a frat house my yeah. sophomore year, but I stopped drinking, stopped doing anything. Every single Sunday, I would cook all my meals for the week, six meals a day. So six times seven, whatever, 42, whatever yeah, that number is. Said, yeah, yeah, 42. Um, I would cook that every single Sunday inside of my frat house in the kitchen. I got really dialed into that. After my sophomore year, I'm like, I'm done with this. Done with college. I'm not getting anything out of it. I didn't even want to go to college. I told my mom, like, I don't want to go. Just choose a college for me. Yeah. She picked the college that my sister was going to, so yeah. I went to the same college. Um, and then I got deep into that. I dropped out of college, and I started an auto detailing business. Mm -hmm. For some reason, this idea just came to my mind. I'm like, let me just do this. It was my way out of college. Yeah. Stopped that very soon. Got into fitness, started doing personal training, online fitness training. I went to a fitness event. Someone there was talking about mindset. And I was creating videos on social media at that point in time, um, talking with fitness stuff. Then I started just dropping mindset nuggets inside of it. And people started asking me, hey, what's this? Hey, what's that? And I started going, like, I'm going to attract this into my life, and I would do it. Yeah. I'm going to have, for example, one of the big things was, like, I'm going to have Ty Lopez fly me out to speak on stage at his events. And he did. I met him prior to that, and I just knew that, like, I wanted to, uh, like, reconnect with him and speak on stage. And people were coming to me, so I'm like, there's a demand. Let me start mm -hmm. creating courses and content around it. And I started doing that, and for about... I don't know, six years or so, I just started, I had a business, it was called Power and Purpose, mm -hmm. helping specifically for men, helping men like elevate themselves, taking their lives to the next level. One of the big reasons I did that is because growing up, my dad, mm -hmm. he was in and out of jail and on drugs, so I saw he didn't have responsibility, his mindset was shot out, and I knew I wanted to be different, I wanted to create a different element for myself, and I wanted other men to take control of their lives, mm -hmm. so that's kind of how I got into that, and I kind of made that transition, I started going deep into that, deep into the law of attraction, deep yeah. into all that good stuff. How has fitness, do you think, helped you your entrepreneurial journey? Tremendously. Yeah. I mean, everything about it. It's like mindset-wise, discipline. Every single morning I go in the cold plunge. Like, just the discipline, the discipline to work out every single, I don't work out every day, like four or five days a week. You, what it does to your headspace, what it does, like, you just function differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Different operation. I couldn't agree more. I The majority of entrepreneurs, though, including myself from time to time, uh, don't take their health, like they sacrifice their health to build wealth, mm -hmm. you know? Seems to be the most common sacrifice, right? I'm gonna, I'm just gonna work all the time. Yeah. I'm never gonna go to the gym, you know, or I'm, I'm never gonna, or I'm gonna sacrifice like my relationship or like whatever, right? To build wealth. And then they end up spending the second half of their life spending all their wealth to try to regain their health. Yes, exactly. You, know? you see that before? 100%. And yeah. you feel that. And it's so interesting because like, let's say you take three weeks off from the gym, three weeks, up work, weeks off from eating right, you feel it. Oh, for You sure. feel sluggish. So it's like, why are you doing it? You're holding yourself back. Yeah. If you're competing with someone who, let's say you go, in the, go into a meeting, right? <clears throat> let's say you're working on a merger or something or you're going to be buying a deal or whatnot. If that person, w the one person wakes up in the morning, eats donuts, eats a bunch of crap, goes into the meeting, or you're working out, you get your workout in, you get your cold plunge yeah. in, you're eating right, you have your shake, you go there, who's going to win? Right, you're gonna win. Yeah, hundred percent every gonna have time. More energy. Yeah. Well, be and not only that, you know how you do anything is how you do everything. Yes. Right. So I would imagine the same guy who's going to the gym and hitting the cold plunge and eating healthy. You know, he's making his bed. He's, you know what I mean. Like he's clean shaved. He's got his hair on point. Like he's he looks he's dressed accordingly. Right. Yes. Like, um, because how you do anything is how you do everything. Right. Yes. And we 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 see that in life all the time. You know. So, uh, yeah. No, I think it's actually really fascinating. So talk to me a little bit about like the law of attraction. Right. You say I attracted a lot of this into my life. Elaborate on that. Yeah, I feel like the way that that works, I feel like we have to become worthy for the things that we want. Even the mentor who I attracted in my life in the mobile home park space. It's like, I knew I wanted a, a mentor who was worth over nine figures. Like mm -hmm. I had that written down. Even my fiance, like I knew exactly what I wanted and I wasn't capable of getting it until I became worthy, until I did the work. The mentor wouldn't have worked with me if I didn't get myself in a specific mm -hmm. position to do so, if I wasn't taking action on what I said. My fiance, I wouldn't have attracted her into my life if I wasn't the type of person who did go to the gym, who did work out, who did have the business set, set in place. I feel like a lot of people, a lot of the message of the law of attractions, like I can just put something out there and attract into my life. Mm -hmm. You have to do the work. Like it's gonna meet you halfway. Like the law of attraction will bring it here, but you gotta go here. Yeah. You have to do the work to meet it. You gotta be on that same frequency, that same energetic frequency. Mm, yeah, I love that. Yeah, you know, you hear a lot in relationships. Like I've listened to a lot of stuff and they're like, they're like, identify like the type of person, if you're single, right? Like identify the type of person that you want to be with, okay? Mm -hmm. And then think about what what type of person would that type of person want to be with? Yes. And then write that down, and that's who you have to become. Yes. To to get to be with that type of person. Exactly. Right? Like, you got to freaking become it before you can have it. You, yeah, you know? can't just write down who you yeah. want. You got to write down who you have to For become, sure. too, and take action in regards to that. Which is, like, the most important thing. Yep. Right? People are just like, that's who I want. And then they're not, they're not willing to become who they need to be 
to attract somebody like yeah. that, right? That's that goes, the hard work. Oh, that's real hard work, yeah. dude. You know, like you're actually gonna look at that. You're gonna be like, dang, that type of person would probably want like a bunch of crap. You know, mm-hmm. like they want me to be dialed in, in in most areas of my life. I want to talk a minute too for, um, you know, I'm I'm fascinated by like ayahuasca and uh, the retreats and and all the. Uh, different things to do personal development. You know, I've been to a bunch of them, right? Mm-hmm. So talk to me about your journey with all that. Yeah. So I'm all about just becoming a greater version of myself. Like that's one of my main focuses. So things like ayahuasca, I did a 53 hour training with a Navy SEAL. So I'm going to, not as intense, but in a couple of days, as the time of this recording, I'm going to a thing called Ice Camp. Jesse Itchler, I'm not sure if you know who that yeah, is. I do. Yeah, Ice Camp out in Minnesota, out in the frozen lake, different things of that sort. 10 day silent retreats, Vipassana. I feel like all of these things, allow us to up level, get clear on what we're truly capable of. Now, ayahuasca being a little different than the other ones, like ayahuasca is like, it's a, they say it's like 20 years of personal development in a couple sessions. And like, that's what turned me on. It's like insane. 20 years yeah, of personal I've development. listened to that crap. I've yeah. never been. It's wild. It's the only thing I've never done. It is such a powerful journey. There's so much darkness and then there's so much light. Like you see all the things that you're ignoring in your life. Like those things that you don't even realize are there. Like pain points, gaps that you have, ways that you're self-sabotaging. So it gets dark in the beginning of your, for some people, right? It can get dark. And you just want to ask, like, when you're doing the ayahuasca, like, give me the journey I need. Mm -hmm. And my journey specifically, like, it was very dark in the beginning. I'm seeing all my pain points. I'm seeing where I'm lacking. I'm seeing my weaknesses. I'm seeing this. And it sucks. And I knew my journey specifically, I wanted to, like, release my ego and and be humbled and, and fully understand, like, and allowing myself to receive support and different things of that sort. So my journey, my, on my first night of doing it, I was going through it, saw a lot of like different pain points and different challenges and whatnot, and then it lasted about four hours. After that four-hour period of time, the bell rings, and you're able to go back to your room. So I get up. I'm still a little dizzy, but I go back to my room. Yeah. I'm back in my room, and I'm laying there, and I just see like images in my mind. I close my eyes, and I just start seeing things, and things are everywhere. I'm like, I need to get this out of my system. I go out of my room, and I throw up. I'm like, I need to get this out. I go back in my room because I'm like, I, I can go back to my room. Like, I, I'm independent. And still, room spinning. I see, like, animals popping in front of me, like, <laughs> clapping. People laughing at me, like, demons, like, laughing at me. So I'm like, I need to go back. Yeah. Because there was an area where everyone was sitting, and you're able to stay for, like, the rest of the night out there. I'm like, I'm good. I have my own room. I was walking back to that area. The, the, as I'm walking, like, it starts getting further and further. So I start running. I'm like, I need to go back. I get back there. I'm laying there. I'm like, I need help. I ended up staying there all night until 6 a.m. Crawled up in a ball. They put blankets on me. Like, uh-huh. I'm laying there completely humbled. And like, that's what I needed in my experience. I needed to be humbled. I needed to know that I can receive support. Mm. I can allow support in my life because prior to it, like, I was very just like, it's me. That's it. Yep. It gives you exactly what you need. It's insane. Yeah. So I've done Hoffman. If you're familiar, the Hoffman process, I've done uh, Judge Spencer. I've done the advanced retreat with him. I did Landmark Form. I've been to Tony Robbins, obviously, all that crap. Um, I want to do ayahuasca, though. I've looked into it. Which one did you go to? It's in Orlando. So it's the biggest retreat in in all of Europe and America. It's called um, Soul Quest, Mm -hmm. the Church of Ayahuasca. And the way that they're able to have it is because they're considered a church. Mm. They've actually been battling with the DEA for like years. They spend like, I don't know, like 50,000 a month or something battling with the DEA to become legitimate um so i mean they are legit but to be able to be like market themselves on the next level and whatnot um but yeah they're the biggest place and it's a beautiful they like the way that it's set up and everything the people the volunteers or people who have done it prior to it's just like they're all dressed in white it almost feels like there's just angels looking over you and helping you out yeah it's awesome that's insane I, have you seen the one in costa rica i have okay there's a lot in costa rica it's pretty legit yeah there's a couple that look pretty legit yeah too yeah you know i really want to do it i think that i've heard I, but i'm like a little nervous, dude. You're, like, you're gonna you nervous be, going into 100%. it. hundred <laughs> percent. Those are the things that you know you need, right? right? When you're nervous going into it, like the Navy SEAL training, this, like when I feel that in the pit of my stomach, like I don't want to do this. I'm yeah. like, all right, I have to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's time. So talk to me about the Navy SEAL training. Yeah, so that like, was a 53 hour training with the Navy SEALs called Kokoro. That means blending your heart, mind, and spirit. I did that just to up level. They say it's like someone who's done it said it was like 10 triathlons combined all in the three days, no sleep at all, or two and a half days, no sleep whatsoever. You're up the entire time. You're just training. After the first couple hours, your body's done, right? The body's gone. It's all, it becomes a mental game. The, my group, there was 30, I believe there was 32 people who signed up for it. There was like 24 people who showed up. And I think like 13 or like 15 of us actually completed it. Wow. Some guys dropped, like there was three or three guys who dropped within the first hour of it. Even though a lot of them have been training for 
for like months, months on end, some of them even years, they drop right away because it's so challenging and it's, it's testing who you are spiritually and who you are mentally. The body's gone. You were doing it out in the ocean, surf torture, up in, in the pool, like holding up logs, people jumping on us, getting like almost like feeling like we're drowning, um, just running, like uh, climbing up mountains. One of the nights we had to hike up a mountain, it's just pitch black. And we were hiking up this mountain for probably four hours, just hallucinating because it's just pitch black. You don't see anything besides like these little, those little, um, you know, like those lights that people yeah. break. So we all had those attached to our bags and you're just walking, wow. walking for hours. And it's, it's such, and you want to give up. Like, I want to stop this. I don't want to keep doing this. I don't want to keep walking. It just tests you on every level and it shows you what you're capable of. Dang. That's insane. It is. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now talk to me about the uh, cold, right? You're going to do the Jesse Itzler. I'm big in the cold plunge. Mm -hmm. I love the cold plunge. Yes. Um, I need to do it more. I only do it a couple of days a week right now. You do it every day? Every morning, yes. Every morning. And do you have your actual cold plunge like in your backyard or something? Yeah, I have a okay. cold plunge in my backyard. I'll jump into it. In New Jersey, <clears throat> it gets real cold too. So like it's been 28 degrees, 32 degrees. Like the water gets cold. Yeah. It just sets you up for the day, wakes you up, sets you up for success. I'm all about like hacking the body and like the biohacking components of it. If you warm up your body post cold plunge through exercise, they say the increase in your testosterone was like incredible. Yeah. So I'm all about like, what are the cheat codes? What are the different ways that I can like quote unquote cheat the system and hack my body in order to perform at my best? Mm -hmm, I love sure. the cold plunge. So what's the actually thing I hate the cold plunge. I don't love it. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. nobody likes <laughs> the, cold the cold plunge. plunge. Yeah. I hate it every morning. Is it still hard to get into for you? Every morning. Every morning. Yep. Yeah. And is it the first thing you do in the morning? I'll do breath work, meditation, and I'll jump in the cold plunge. Okay. And then you go to the gym after. And then I go to. So I'll either do like a five minute workout and just warm my body up. Uh -huh. Four days a week I'll go to the gym after, but I'll also I'll always do that five minute workout okay. just to warm my body up. And then do you go to the gym right after, out of curiosity, or do you wait a little while? Yeah, so four days a week, I'll go right after. Right after. I'll do the workout, and then I'll go right after. I change it up. I don't always go right after. Sometimes I'll go to the gym at, like, 12 p.m., mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times, like, I'm making the shift to going right after that yeah. in the morning. Okay, got it. I just changed my eating habits, so now I'm able to go to the gym in the morning. I was doing intermittent fasting for seven years. Mm -hmm. I want to eat till like, 1 or 2 p.m., so now I'm like, all right, I'm doing four protein-pacing meals throughout yeah. the day now, so I can go to the gym. You're carnivore now? No, not carnivore. Okay, just have you protein. tried carnivore? No. Yeah, I I'm, tried I'm, I'm trying it right now. Yeah, how yeah, is I'm it? On a, I'm like day five. How is it? I love it. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And is that just like no carbs at all, or is it? Mainly so I'm doing. I'm doing the. Have you seen like that Paul guy? He, he like walks into Whole Foods, like you know. Who yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. About. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Lives I'm doing in like, like Bali or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His version. Uh, so you can do raw honey. Uh, you can do raw milk, like raw kefir, right? You can do. Um, uh, that's pretty much it. And then I think there's like one other thing you can do. And oh, and fruit. So you could do fruit, raw honey, raw kefir, raw milk, uh, and then egg, eggs, and then obviously just all beef, pretty much. So like ribeyes, uh, ground beef, ground elk, ground whatever. It's you know so what crazy mean? the difference, yeah. and like, and this is the difference. Like you have to figure out what works best yeah. for you because nutrition. You'll look that up and be like that. It's gonna kill you. Yeah. You have to be vegan. You have to be this. It's crazy. It's crazy. You gotta find what works for you. Yeah, there is no one thing that everybody can agree on. Yeah, right. When it comes to nutrition mm -hmm. and fitness, I mean like. You, no matter what you do, there will be somebody that tells you that is great for you and somebody else that will tell you that will kill you. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. I mean, if you go vegan, there's there's documentaries that say vegan will kill you. Mm -hmm. There's also doc documentaries that say vegan will save you. Yep. Right? And then the opposite's also true. Yeah. Right? Like, you go full carnivore, and there's people that are like, it's the best thing in the world, and there's other people that are like, you're going to get freaking cancer and die. Yeah. You know? Like, what what do you, who do you believe? You can't, like, there, there's nothing out there that, like, and you just gotta find what works best you for you. You gotta literally figure out how do you feel. You gotta try it all. And I test think. your blood, test do your all blood, the tests. Yep. And I feel like that's very important, a component that a lot of people miss. Something that I'm slacking on is doing the blood test, figuring that out. At one point, I did this thing called Viome. You stand in like a stool sample mm -hmm. and it tells you what foods are best for you, what you're allergic to, what you shouldn't be eating, what you should be eating more of. So I'm like, okay, they tested my gut to see mm -hmm. what it, what I should be doing. But I feel like getting the blood tests and everything is so important. So important. Doing this, like get a blood test prior. Did you get a blood test prior to? Yeah, I've done a couple. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm going to get another one in like a week. Perfect. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Um, and then probably I'll probably make it like a reoccurring thing. See where I'm at, you know, 100%. as I go down the road, right? Um, talk to me about the Jesse Itzler thing. I'm curious about like the cold. Do you follow like uh, Wim Hof and all that? Yeah, so I don't follow Wim Hof too much. I did a lot of his breath work um, probably years ago, but I just love surrounding myself with awesome people and doing crazy things. So with this, it's in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, it's just, you're out in the frozen lake. 
It's called Ice Camp out in the frozen lake. A bunch of awesome entrepreneurs are going to be there, getting the cold, running 10Ks in the cold, and they have like a sauna over there. So jumping in the sauna, doing breath work, doing all that cool stuff. It's like elevating you, doing things that are outside of your comfort zone, creating those trauma bonds with people around yeah. you too because you're in some, doing some traumatic things out there. For sure. What's the most wild thing you've ever done Like when in that world? Like ayahuasca, is it the Navy SEAL? <sighs> I would say the most challenging was Vipassana, the 10-day mm. silent retreat. Yeah. Talk that, to me about that. Yeah, so that was um, 10 days, no talking, no reading, no writing, no exercising. Like, you're meditating for, like, 12 to 14 hours per day, sitting there just, like, completely still in silence. There's, a, there's like, a noise, someone talking a little bit in the background um, on audio, but you're just sitting there. And I did this probably, like, four years ago, five years ago. Yeah. You're becoming so connected to yourself doing that. And, again, just, like, the challenge, like, sitting there and not moving. I didn't move an inch. Like, I made sure that I wasn't budging at all either, and it was painful they said the pain that was coming through you was like mental pain moving through yeah. your body. I also knew like I'm sitting cross-legged, so there's definitely physical pain yeah. too that's <laughs> happening there. Yeah. But you become so present. One thing that built within me was equanimity, like not getting too thrown off when something's so exciting or not getting too thrown off when something's like bad, like having this even keel kind of um, emotions and whatnot around things mm -hmm. and seeing things for what they actually are versus like getting too overwhelmed by anything. Mm -hmm. That was something huge that it did for me. The amount of appreciation that you get while doing that too. Mm -hmm. Like I was helping worms off the blacktop. Like, like there's life and like you become so present. You don't yeah. have your phone on. You don't have anything. And you just become so in tune with like nature and yourself. 10 days. 10 days. Wow. Where? Um, this was, they actually had it in New Jersey. Really? They have camps in different areas, different states. I think Massachusetts is like their main headquarters, but they'll open up randomly in different areas. And they had one like three months from when I did it. There was a waiting list. I got on it. And I'm like, oh, perfect. Wow. It was like three hours for me. It was perfect. Interesting. I, so have you done Joe Dispenza at all? I've done like his meditations okay. and whatnot, but I haven't gone to any of his retreats. I definitely want retreats to. Retreats are pretty cool. Yeah. I did the advanced retreat. How was and that? And you do like long meditations. Like we did a med we did a uh, I think it was like a four or five hour meditation. Okay. Um, one of the one of the days, and then every day you're doing like two, three, four hour meditations. You know, pretty much every day. You like, hear multiple crazy stuff. a day. Yeah. Like you like wake up, you do like a two and a half hour meditation, and then like he'll talk for a couple hours. You do like a two hour meditation. He'll talk for a couple hours. You do like a two hour meditation. You know. Were you and meditating then, prior to? A little bit. And mm -hmm. so that really messed me up because I yeah. went there like not really meditating a bunch. Like I had meditated in my life. Like, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like I was brand new to the world. But leading up to that, I wasn't really in a rhythm of meditating. So like then all of a sudden it was just like, boom, like you're meditating eight hours a day. You know, mm -hmm. and I was like, holy crap. There is one point where I almost walked out. Yeah. And I didn't walk out. Yeah. He like, says that, too. Yeah, like There's going to be a challenging point. Yeah. Yeah. I remember sitting there vividly thinking to myself. I'm going to get the hell up and I'm going to walk the hell out of the room uh -huh. and I'm not going to look back, yeah. you know, and, I, I <laughs> and it doesn't do it. matter. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, I'm out. I'm done, you know, and I didn't end up doing it, dude. I, uh, I stayed there and I'm grateful that I did, but yeah, like, and then you look back and you're like, Oh, like, like on like day five or six or seven, um, you, you like look at like day one versus like day like five. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're like, dude, I've been totally different human being. Like I can't, like, I think day five or six was, like, our longest meditation of, like, the five or six days, right? Mm -hmm. And if you would have told me on day one that on day six I was going to do that long of a meditation, like, I would have left on day one, yeah. right? But they don't tell you. You know, you, like, work your way up, uh -huh. right? And then, uh, but it's pretty cool, dude. I love that crap. What would you say was, like, if anything, like, any big takeaways that you got from it or anything that you, like, <laughs> found within yourself? A lot of the stuff that you're talking about, right, yeah. just, like, you know, we get so, we get so in our own world right as human beings i think like w the human being is capable of anything mm -hmm. right and so like you I always get that that's like always my main takeaway every time i do anything right mm -hmm. like 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 that it's like okay i can do anything i put my mind to um and i'm my, i'm my worst enemy like i'm i'm the only guy who's ever going to get in my own way mm -hmm. like nobody's ever going to get in my in my way like anything that i've ever stressed about or anything that i've ever overthought about or anything i've ever had anxiety about or whatever it might be right like it's just me versus yeah. me you know and i think you really learn that at crap like that right yes you learn like this reality of like i can do anything i want and if i don't do it then it's on me like mm -hmm. i'm the only one to blame yeah like i can't point my finger at anybody else because i have full control of my reality it's right? so cool too because i feel like these things like it's become so like unconscious to us that like we can do it like mm -hmm. we're gonna take it on we're gonna do it and to most people, it's like, I can't do it. Yeah. But doing these things, it just completely elevates that. And you're like, this is something that I thought I couldn't do going into it, but I did it. And now look where I'm at. And you look back, you're like, oh, yeah, that was, quote unquote, seems a lot simpler mm -hmm. when you're looking back on it. Like, what else is that simple that I'm 
seeing as being a big challenge for myself right now. Almost everything. Yeah. Yeah. Where do people start, do you think? Like, if they're brand new to the journey, you know, if they're not, if they haven't done what you've done or what I've done, like, where does somebody listening start? I feel like there's so much out there right now. I know where I started, I... And, like, there's different opinions on this movie, but the movie The Secret, like, mm. that came across me, and I watched that a couple times, and I let it really click, talking about the law of attraction. Just, it talks about how your mind works and, like, the control that you have. Mm -hmm. So if you're open to it, like, that's a great place to start. Sometimes for people, if I say, like, reading a book, people won't make their way through a full yeah. entire book. The movie's, like, an hour and a half long. Like, put that on and just get an understanding of, like, what we're talking about. And once you do, that's going to open up your mind to, like, oh, this is here. This is what I'm capable of. Tony Robbins has great stuff, mm -hmm. and he and he really breaks down on like a beginner level. Now I love Joe Dispenza stuff. Yeah. Can be a little overwhelming for it people can. who are just getting brand new, who are brand new at this stuff. Yeah. The way that he goes about things, I'm still trying to figure out his meditations when he's like in space and like I'm yeah. like, where am I going in this meditation? Yeah. It's <laughs> challenging. Weird, dude. Yeah. Um, you should go to one of his retreats. I want you, to. Yeah. Like, dude, you do some wild crap, right? You do like walking meditations where you're like you're you're or like standing meditations, and you'll. Imagine for a minute, right? Like, see, when you go to uh, uh, Joe Dispenza, Richie, there's 3,000 people in a ballroom, mm -hmm. right? So now imagine for a minute that all 3,000 people, just quite a few people, mm -hmm. right? Um, they all stand up at one time and walk outside, okay? 3,000 people. And then th you'll, like, uh, there'll be, like, a bridge or where, depending on where you're at, right? You'll have all these people standing, okay, with their eyes shut, meditating for, like, an hour and a half, Right? And what it looks like if you're not a person meditating, like if you're driving, oh, and then like, he'll tell you like, walk up to like a tree and like stand in front of the tree, right? Like, dude, there's videos, bro. It's the funniest shit. He get like, they get the cops called all the time. Really? Because when you're driving, it looks like a zombie apocalypse, bro. <laughs> when you're driving, there's like 3,000 people. People are literally just standing in front of a tree, like with their eyes That's closed. Wild. And there's thousands of them, you know? You're like, what, <laughs> what the hell is going, hell's going on? She's so scared driving yeah. by that. But it's just, that. It, he puts you through weird crap, but yeah. it's so good for you, dude. Yeah. You know, like you learn like, how to, I don't know, like, just just do all that, you know? And then he talks about, like, the energy that's, like, there when mm -hmm. that's happening. And the, the results that he gets for some people are it's insane. insane. Like, yeah. people who, were, like, couldn't see and then who had, like, mm -hmm. tumors and that starts to subside. And Wild. Who can't walk and now they're walking. Like, he's uh, he's up to some really awesome stuff and how they track yeah. it, too. It's crazy. Yeah, the uh, going into, yeah, space and time. Yeah. And, you know <laughs> what I mean? I love that crap, dude. Yeah. I, I don't know that I can even figure it out yet, but um, I try when I meditate. I'm like, what's he talking about? Yeah, you what know? is he saying? All right, I'm just going to try to. And then I like, and then I'm like, oh, I, I'm missing the point. Like, I got to stop thinking. You're using your thinking brain. Yes. Right? And and that's like the entire point of meditation is we're trying to figure it all out. Uh-huh. And I've, that, I think that's another thing that I'm I learned during a lot of the meditation is like, we have the tendency, I think, especially as like an entrepreneur, to try to figure everything out, mm -hmm. right? So even when you're meditating, mm -hmm. you're not supposed to try to figure anything uh, yeah. out. You're, you're supposed to just figure nothing out, yeah. actually. Like you're going to nothing land, right? And so the moment you catch yourself trying to figure out what he's talking about, you're you're kind of missing the point, yes. right? Like now, obviously, they say there's no such thing as a bad meditation, right? But um, I don't know. How do you feel about all that? Yeah, I feel like allowing yourself to let go is so important. Because mm -hmm. as you said, like as entrepreneurs, we want to be in control. We want to we mm -hmm. want to figure things out and figure out what is this doing for me? What is this doing for me? And that's our space to let go and allow infinite intelligence, allow that energy to come to us. And like the thoughts, like sometimes like in a lot of my meditations, I'll just get thoughts that just pop in my head. I'm like, wow, I didn't even think of that for business or for this and like what I could piece together. If I was just trying to think the whole time or trying to figure yeah. things out, it's like it's my own beliefs that I'm getting versus they talk about like there's thoughts out in the ether. And yeah. if you're on the same energetic frequency, like thoughts never go away. Energy can't be created or destroyed. So if you're thinking or if you're working on something, you let go of it, you allow yourself to sit there. Like you'll get thoughts from like other people who have worked on those things or whatnot mm. that come to your mind. And you're like, then you start to act on those things. And like that's where true creativity comes from and where you can really create next level things versus like us trying to figure out this is what I know. So yeah. let me do it this way. It's so powerful, dude. I yeah. love it, man. Well, dude, we, we talked about a bunch, man. So talk to me, back to the mobile homes. We'll come full circle, okay? Mm -hmm. um, what is your goal, right, right now? Like, how, is there a target, like, hey, every month I want to make 100 grand a month or yeah. I want to make 50 grand a month? Like, where are you trying to head with all that? Yeah, so we're really looking to scale this business on the next level. Like I said, we're now in the works of we're purchasing like 120 homes at once and really working on them. We actually have 200-something homes that we're going to be taking over. And then we are just able to replicate that. Like, we can get ourselves to a point where we're – taking over a thousand homes, 2000 homes from like we're 
we have the connections and whatnot to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So just really want to scale this to the next level. And I mean, it's going to be insane. Like I'm able to get $80,000 on one mobile home, like yeah. doing, having the crews in play and the people in play and really figuring out the systems behind this to be able to do hundred mobile homes at a time. And a, a big reason for this is like, we're increasing the supply of affordable homes. They say mobile homes is the last real form of affordable, affordable housing. We're increasing the supply of mobile homes in the market, which means we're increasing the supply of affordable homes. And it's so needed right mm -hmm. now in this day and age right now. So if my company can do that, and like this is something I go to events. I was in Switzerland a couple months ago. I was at this event called ActI. Mm -hmm. And I realized like a lot of these people who are like a lot of European companies, like they were so mission driven. And adding this mission and like mm -hmm. really making this the full focus of what we're doing now, it's just going to take it to a whole nother level. I see my uh, mind operating in a completely different way. So, I mean, we want to do millions per month, like yeah. really taking it to that place with also increasing the supply, like a hundred mm. mobile homes per month, like getting it on that scale where we're just boom, yeah, moving in these mobile homes. It's super cool. Do you think yeah. anybody watching could get into flipping a mobile home, make an extra five, 10 grand a month? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. We have, so we have our academy, our mobile home success academy, where we're teaching people how to do this, teaching people how to get into the business and get started on, and we have people who are flipping single mobile homes and like, that's been my path for the longest period mm -hmm. of time. So like, that's the way to go when you're getting started, flip a mobile home, flip two mobile homes, one mobile home per month, and you get two mobile homes per month and you just continue to scale that. Yeah. Like it's such a, because there's such little competition, it's such a lower barrier to entry when it comes to cost and it's so low risk. Like it's, it's a great model to get into. Mm, yeah. Where would you suggest if you just give a, have to give a piece of advice that for somebody wanting to get in right now, now obviously they can go check out your program, mm -hmm. but like what would be a practical piece of advice to find their first mobile home flip? Yeah, so I always say, like, get started. Look at the mobile home parks in your area because you'd be surprised within a two-hour radius how many parks that there are. How do you do that? So just Google search okay. mobile home parks near me. Do a quick Google search. You'll see the mobile home parks that are in your area. Call up these managers. We have specific questions that we'll run through with management, but call up these managers and ask, can I do this in the park? Mm -hmm. Go on Facebook Marketplace or go on Zillow. A lot of times, and don't be discouraged, if you're looking at mobile homes online on Zillow, you're going to see the highest price ones, the ones that realtors listed. Those aren't typically the ones that we're buying. We'll see them on Marketplace mm -hmm. or from bandit signs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. We get those homes. So if you're open to like put up some bandit signs outside of communities, make those phone calls and negotiate these mobile home prices. If you're looking online, like if I'm looking online, I'll see mobile homes for $120,000 plus. Those aren't going to be the ones that you're purchasing. Go on Marketplace. Look at them. Schedule a couple appointments with people and get inside those mobile homes. Just get a feel for what it looks like and negotiate. Know that they're willing to lower their price point mm -hmm. because it's a need for them to get it off their hands. There's a reason why they want to move. Yep. So, I mean, to... Drop down, like, I know you asked for, like, one piece of advice. It's kind of yeah. going oh, all over the place with that. Look at mobile homes in your area and just see what you can buy them for. Mm -hmm. Allow that to give you the confidence to realize, like, I can get started in real estate for a lot less than I think it's mm -hmm. going to cost me to get started in real estate. Yeah. Phenomenal advice. Yeah. All right. What, what is one piece of advice? And wrap up here. Um, for anybody out there who might want to just succeed in life, they want to be a healthier version of themselves, they want to be a well-rounded version. They want to be an entrepreneur. They want to make more money. They want to have better relationships, right? Like what's kind of one thing you've learned as just an adult after all the things that you've done, just kind of a overarching piece of advice that you feel like you could give any human being that if they took that piece of advice, it would better their life. Yeah. Um, very generic, but very powerful. Like just focus on becoming a better version of you. Mm. So like, don't focus on competing with this person, competing with that person, focus on competing with that old version of yourself with that version of yourself that's currently there. What's one thing that you can do to challenge yourself tomorrow, today? And take action immediately. So many times we'll create goals and we'll write down like, this is what I wanna do, this is where I wanna be. But what action can you take right now to get you there? Because there's something you can do. And once you start to get in momentum, you're gonna stay in momentum and allow that momentum to follow, but take action now. Get clear on being a better version of you, get clear on what that thing is, and take action on it right now. It's so powerful, dude. Hey, where can people find you? How do they find your program? Where do they follow you? So program, go to mobilehomesuccess.com slash training. We have a free training video over there. Follow me, Instagram, George Bohar 4 I'm on Instagram. We post every single day on there. Cool. I appreciate you being on the show, man. Appreciate you Hope to get me. you back in a couple of years and see how many parks you own. Yep. Yeah. Whatever scale looks like. Awesome. I appreciate it, bro. Hey, if you're still watching, do me a huge favor. Subscribe if you haven't already. Smash that like button. Drop a comment down below. Find all of George's information in the description down below. I appreciate you again, and we'll see you in the next one.